Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Hussein Al Mosawi. Hussein is a product designer, digital artist, and author. He's known for his futuristic designs. He has done product designs and consulting for companies such as Nike, Apple, Google, Adidas, EI Sports, Intel, and Ford Motors. He has taught design at several universities, and he loves blurting the lines between design and storytelling. And today, we'll speak about his book, The Innovator's Handbook, a, sh a short guide to unleash your creative mindset. Hussein, thank you. Oh, <laughs> Hussein, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. So uh, you have an amazing background ever since you were a little kid you wanted to be a designer and you wanted to work for particular brands can you tell us back to your early days why is it that you wanted to be a designer someone i mean many kids want to be an astronaut and <laughs> a cowboy fire fireman but you wanted to be doing design why is that sure so so yeah it all started from a very young age uh I came from a family that was artistic and also into sports. So those two things, they were always uh, there in, at home. So growing up, I loved sports and I played sports and I I was dreaming of one day playing in the NBA uh, basketball. So I was really into sports. And then that passion for sports, it allowed me to get into design as well, because as a kid, I was designing like desktop wallpapers for different NBA athletes, NFL athletes. Uh, just for fun and we were doing it online we were a bunch of uh, kids at school uh, from all over the world uh, just creating this art for no money for nothing just Wait, out of passion was the nba popular in your country and can you tell us which country are you from sure 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 so i'm originally from a small island called bahrain uh, it's in the middle east and yeah there's a good amount of uh, people that play basketball and watch basketball so i was really into basketball So, so yeah, that kind of drove me into design and just doing uh, like designs for fun for NBA athletes. And then that started to uh, turn into something that was more monetized. And I got to work on actual projects for some NBA players, uh, like doing some designs like for Allen Iverson, Chauncey Billups, uh, Tracy McGrady, different uh, athletes. Uh, and then as that passion grew, I went to university. I studied design, Uh, got more clients, uh, did internships, uh, did an internship with Nike, worked for companies like EA Sports, Adidas, consulted a lot for Nike. Uh, and now I'm still, now I have my own studio and I'm working with different clients and tech automotive and including, of course, uh, the sports industry. Okay. Well, in addition to being an artist designer, I also see a little bit of an entrepreneur in you. How is it that from your country, you were uh, uh, reaching out to these uh, athletes? Sure, sure, sure. So, so yeah, absolutely. Entrepreneurship, it's a, it's a huge thing. Uh, in 2019, I started my own studio, Musawi Studios, uh, where I get to work on different cool projects with different cool clients. And being from such a small island, much, such a small country on the other side of the world, I'm in the US now, uh, it always, I, I think it played a big role in teaching me to dream big and have big aspirations and impossible is nothing. Because... Uh, being so far and being from a place where there weren't like many designers and artists who who made it let's say and worked for these big companies i think i'm uh, from my country uh, when i was working in these uh, companies i was like the only one so it as a mindset it became something that is it impossible or not so i was always pushing for dreaming big but also trying to chase that dream no matter what and trying to to make it a reality so that was my aspiration for sure Okay, and um, I live in Canada, uh, and I see from your bio that you spent some time in Canada. Can you tell us just to... Absolutely. So I did my of... master's in industrial design, master's of design in industrial design at the University of Alberta. And then I worked for EA Sports in Vancouver. So I was always on the West Coast. And uh, how is it that you make a decision to be in one of the hottest country in the world to be <laughs> one of the coldest country in the world why canada it was good the program was really good uh got pretty good opportunities there uh so yeah i joined the program and then from there i went to ea sports so so yeah that's why canada okay well okay uh, now um 
in regards to design, I have a friend, my best friend actually, and this person uh, is such a creative person. She writes poetry, she creates dance choreography, she writes plates, yeah, she draws. It's like inspiration and creativity is pouring out of her ears, you know? And then you get to hear about people who say, oh, I'm just not creative, you know, like uh, I'm just a regular person. So can you talk about who is creative and who is not? Do we lose it when we grow up? What's going on there? I think a big part of creativity, like if you look at kids, I feel like we can all say that kids are very creative in whatever they do, whether it's art or anything they try to do, they always try to come up with smart and cool solutions, whether it works or doesn't work. So I think that uh, aspect of, I think there's two things. One is uh, being curious at all times, uh, trying to see how things work, why they work the way they work as kids. That's why they become creative. And the other thing is uh, not being afraid of failure. As we grow up, I feel like we draw these boundaries around ourselves of being judged and maybe failing and embarrassing ourselves and doing things that make us look bad. But uh, being fearless is a big part of being creative. Uh, and by creative, I don't just mean like doing a piece of art, even in entrepreneurship and business and leadership. How can you be creative? How can you do things differently? So I think those two things, curiosity and also uh, not fearing failure definitely two big things and for a regular person let's say i'm a secretary okay and i go to the office from nine to five and then when i come back i'm i'm tired so i turn on netflix or maybe i have a glass of wine how can i integrate let's say i read your book and i say wow you know i would like to enlist the creativity in my mind how can i start doing integrating some practices in my life, in my busy life, in order to start fomenting that creativity? Well, the first thing in anything, I mean, if we take a step back, uh, do you really want to be creative and do you really want to pursue this? So I think that's a question everybody has to ask themselves. And if you are truly passionate about something, no matter how busy, how busy you are and how life gets in the way, you'll always find some time to do it if that's your true passion. Because I always see people who, who have these dreams and aspirations and they want to make it big and they want to do this and that, but they just uh, talk the talk. You also got to walk the walk. So if you really want to achieve something, then you have to put in the time, the effort, and things don't happen overnight. But let's say you do want to take that step and you want to think outside the box, you want to be creative, then that th those are some of the insights and lessons that I share in my book, that innovation and creativity, it's not something that should be overwhelming. It's something that uh, anybody can do. And working within these big companies and with some brilliant minds and brilliant teams, I saw that it's really some small insights and tweaks in our mindsets and the way that we look at things that allow us to push the boundaries and think outside the box. And that's how innovation happens. Because from afar, we see like this big company, big brand name, and you know we get scared like, oh, they came up with this big idea. I can never do that. But in reality, these big companies, they're all made up of four or different, four or five different small teams. Uh, with I mean, four to five different individuals on each team. And that's where the innovation happens. So we have to think of it at that scale. Right. And sometimes the ideas are big, but sometimes the creativity takes place in making things small and simple. Like, oh, this is so simple. Why I didn't think of that before. Exactly. I mean... exactly. <laughs> and also, I mean, to your point, uh, being laser focused, it's really important. Uh rather than thinking of the big picture and thinking of everything. So when I worked a lot in the footwear industry, sports, and when we were like designing a shoe, let's say the shoe had to be comfortable, it had to have durability, it had to be lightweight. We never really looked at the shoe and let's design for all those things. Let's solve all those problems. We just took one specific thing. Let's say we took lightweight. How can we make the shoe the most lightweight shoe on earth? What are the lightest materials? What is making the current shoe heavy? Just focus on that one single question. And then we would design for comfort. Then we would design for durability. And then we have these different buckets and different ingredients. And we start to mix and match different ideas. 
But when you're solving a problem, it's always good to be laser focused on one thing rather than everything together because you get lost and confused. Okay, well, uh, this uh, astonished me about your work is that you are a person who is, uh, as I see you as a creative person, sitting down in front of a, a computer or maybe a desk and drawing designs. But now you are creating bicycles, you are creating shoes, <laughs> you are doing, I don't know, architecture. You're doing so many things that I feel like in in order to find the limits and, and, and come up with interesting or an alternative design, you have to have hand-on experience. And I just don't know how you got that from just sitting in front of your computer. Sure. Can you tell us about <laughs> how, you know, how you cross that line from, oh, someone just sitting in front of the computer to someone actually feeling the texture and knowing what's the best uh, material for this shoe. Someone who, I, I mean, I know you like basketball, but you're not a professional basketball player. So uh, sure, sure, yeah, sure, sure. enlighten us. So, so I think there's a diff few different elements here uh, that uh, it's good to separate. Uh, so the first one is the craft. So when I'm working, let's say on architecture or when I'm working on a project in CGI or 3D, or when I'm sketching something on paper, this is all a skill that gets involved over time. Of course, through the working with companies, going to university, get YouTube tutorials. That's a craft that you can uh, enhance and improve on. Just visually, it looks pleasing, getting to know how the programs work and so on. The other side is what is the idea? So I can have all those projects that you talked about, the car, the bicycle, the architecture, the shoes, uh, but what's the idea? So you really need the science, you need how, why you've done a project, you need the science, and you also need imagination, science and imagination, two things that hand in hand. You need the art, uh, how beautiful it looks, and you need the utility as well, how it functions. So a lot of this at line, we might see that, oh, it's executed very nicely, but uh, again, what's the, what's the vision behind it? What's the idea behind it? And that's really where innovation comes in. Uh, having a good idea is good, but you also need to execute it to the highest level possible. Okay, well, good. Um, but uh, also you uh, mentioned, I mean, uh, I see it from reading your book and from your website that you also try to integrate storytelling into your designs. Uh, now, this is another set of skills, storytelling. <laughs> like how now you come up with a nice looking shoe, for example. How do you come up with a story that this shoe is supposed to tell us? Sure. So, so when I started designing, uh, when I was growing up, learning to design and designing and getting in the industry, uh, my, ma my main goal was just to do something that looked cool and nice until I joined Nike internship. And then that really shifted my mind towards innovating. But uh, as I got to work in these companies and as I uh, started to evolve my process, I got to know that story is a really, really, really important part of the process. And when I have a shoe, when I have a car, when I have anything, if there is a strong story in the beginning, that serves as the base of what I design and how I design and why I design. And when it comes to the time when I'm marketing the product and bringing it to market, uh, I need a strong story. Like for example, uh, that's something that I didn't know when I joined Nike. If you look at most Nike shoes, if you turn it and look at the outsole, the bottom side of the shoe, you'll see like a waffle pattern. And the story behind that is that the first Nike shoe that was that happened or the first innovation with Nike was that Bill Bowerman, the founder, he poured some uh, rubber into a waffle machine uh, and then he made the, the rubber of the shoe. And that's an actual story and it's a huge innovation. And it's part of the Nike DNA and the Nike story of how that shoe was made and why it was made. Of course, he did it to reduce weight and have a certain pattern. Uh, and now on most of Nike shoes, uh, you'll see that waffle pattern. Like just go to the Nike store and you'll see it. So story is really important. And it also, it's also really important because it connects the consumer and the end user uh, and it makes it personal for them if they're connected to the culture or to the story or the, you know, the idea behind it. So being personal in people's lives, I th that's super important in design and innovation in general. Okay, great. Uh, in your book, you tell us to think outside of the box, but uh, I find that many of us have a hard time thinking inside of the box, finding the <laughs> limits, you know, what is my box? What are the things? Uh, like many artists, for example, before they started coming up with their creative uh, designs, let's say Picasso, whatever, they started replicating 
other artists and studying and what is it that this person before me did so uh aren't you jumping the button <laughs> no that's that's a it's a very good point and i also mentioned it in the book so when we sometimes start to think of innovation we think about reinventing the wheel and that's never the case uh, a big part of innovation is actually evolution uh what products were done before me what have other great minds and great brands done before me how can i take that how can i add my spin and my twist to it and create something new and better because most products around us I mean, there's always room for innovation and improvement and evolution so whether it's my phone whether it's my keyboard my monitor my desk there's always something that i could probably tweak to improve it whether it's the materials the functionality and so on so building on what others have done Uh, and seeing what has been done and how can I take it to the next step, that's really one of the easiest ways and uh, it's just low-hanging fruit for you to to innovate on. So so definitely evolution and not reinventing the wheel. Perfect. And uh, also another thing that I, I got from your book is that uh, you teach us how to fail. And I think it's easy to say to somebody else in North America, okay, fail, fail often and get up and try it again. But... Th- and, I mean, you come from another culture and we have to admit that people from other cultures, failure is actually something shameful. You know, people don't want to fail. They don't want to fail in front of others. So they are afraid of trying new things because that they may fail, of course. So uh, for people outside of North America, what would be an easy way to integrate or to accept failure as part of the learning process? Uh, I think there's lots of inspiration around us. Like even going back to sports, if we look at uh, local legends, wherever, whatever country you look at, I mean, look at the superstars around the world. They all came from small teams. They all came from very humble beginnings, uh, but they pushed and pushed and pushed. So having that kind of persistence and not giving up and really chasing your dream, that's the number one goal. Uh, now, how culture looks at you as a failure, I think that's really different from country to country. But uh, but again, surrounding yourself in a positive bubble and staying away from negative people, because wherever you go, there's positive people and there's negative people. And surrounding yourself with that positive energy, I think that's really what helped me thrive. Like my family was super supportive. I had friends who were super supportive and encouraged me and pushed me. Uh, I used to show them designs like every day back in school. Like, what do you think? What do you think? I was super excited. So they could have let me down and told me like, just think about something else or they could have pushed me, which they did. Mm. So having that positive bubble, not just growing up, even now, like the people I surround myself with, uh, I want a positive energy. Uh, I don't want a fake energy. I want it to be also real. Like I'd like to take advice and learn from others, but I try to keep the negativity out of the picture. Okay, well, uh, you are an artist, you are an entrepreneur. I assume that your day-to-day life is busy. You have a wife. I don't know if you have kids or not, but uh, but it sounds like you have you, you have your hands full. And yet you put time aside in order to create this book and not only just create a book, but create a book that is different from all the other books that I see in the bookshelf. And uh, I just told you this before our conversation started. Uh, this is the most beautiful book I have read. You know? <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> so first of all, where the idea of writing a book came about and why why not just write a book, but also uh, tweak the design? I mean, you got colors, we got uh, graphics, we have a, a weird shape. Where all this come from? <laughs> sure. So in terms of time, again, it goes back to passion. Uh, if you really want to do something, you'll always find a way to do it. I mean, back to your point you were asking me earlier, people are busy. How can they find the time? Uh, if you really want to do something, you'll always find the time. Uh, so I've taught at different universities. I've also give keynotes and uh, workshops at different design conferences about innovation. So those ideas, they kind of start to come together as I was teaching them and sharing with people. There was always great interest of Uh, how you can innovate. And I really saw people like through my workshops uh, coming up with cool ideas. So I started to turn it into a series of blog posts and then that started to evolve and evolve. And then eventually I thought it would make sense to make a book. Uh, In terms of the design, again, I'm a designer and an artist. So I had to add my touch to the book. Uh, I want it to be more as an object. Uh, So it's not just a book. It's actually something that you could, you know, showcase and put on your bookshelf and look nice. 
So, so that's why it has all the Pantone colors. It's special kind of paper. The holographic foiling on the cover, it actually changes color with different lightings. If you go outside, if you go in the, you know, different light setups, it's going to change color. So small touches like that. And yeah, it's something on my bucket list that I always wanted to do. Uh, so that's how it came to life. Well, congratulations. And yes, now that you say uh, phantom colors, uh, yeah, I noticed that the colors were unique and I didn't know what was unique about it, but now <laughs> you just gave me the answer. Well, just to finish this conversation, can you tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners reach out and follow the work that you're doing? I mean, I, I saw your website. I just scroll and scroll and every design looks so, so <laughs> Thank you. unreal. Thank you. Thank you. So the book is called The Innovator's Handbook, A Short Guide to Unleashing Your Creative Mindset. And it's available on Amazon as paperback and Kindle version. I just had to insist, like uh, your publisher insists with me to get the paper version, because I, I don't think you will get the same feeling if you get for the sure, digital. Sure. I, I mean, I don't know what the digital version looks like. I don't even want to know anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, it's, but it's good to have though, like international shipping gets a bit crazy these days with the mm. uh, I think there's supply chain issues. So it's good to have that option also for those who can't get the paperback. Well, Hussein, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Likewise, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.